want to just set this text a little bit. There's a clear and present danger to these first century believers who we received this letter. They had stepped out of a works-based religion and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The danger they faced was to grow weary, to take their focus off from Jesus and go back to the law, back to the old system. That's what, that's what the writer is engaging them with. It was hard for them. They faced uh, growing persecution, and this book was, was written to encourage them to press on to maturity in Christ because, well, because he's better. So the author keeps pushing that. He wants them to stand firm in their faith, to run the race of life that is set before them with endurance as they continually look to Jesus. That's what this text is about. And I think how fitting is this word for us today? How fitting is it for me, I believe, and for you? We face things that can cause us to lose heart, that can cause us to run this race poorly and not finish well. This chapter, chapter 12, begins to look at the Christian life and how it should be lived based upon the truths that the Spirit of God has set forth to this point. Now, there are a couple things I want to cover in this text today. The first is how to run, who to focus on, and finally, how he ran, how Jesus ran. That'll be verse 3. Let's begin with how to run, verse 1. The Spirit of God led the Apostle Paul in these metaphors, and look what he says here. Therefore, since we have so... Not Paul, I shouldn't say that. The first... <laughs> the Spirit of God led this author. I'll get to Paul in a minute and his metaphors. But here it is, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, points back to these ones in chapter 11 who ran their race with endurance. Let us lay aside every encumbrance, the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So here we see this metaphor of the Christian life. It's that of running a race. It's not the first time in a scripture you see a similar metaphor Paul used a lot of metaphors in his writing. I'm not saying he wrote this. But I'll give you some examples. Uh, I'm not going to have you turn there, but 2 Timothy uh, 2, verses 3 through 6, Paul uses a number of them there. This is just for illustration. He uses the metaphor of the Christian life as a good soldier. He uses a metaphor of the Christian life as an athlete. He uses the metaphor of the Christian life as a hardworking farmer. In chapter 4, verse 7, he employs a couple metaphors to the Christian life there. One is that of a wrestling match. He's in a wrestling match. That's what it's like uh, living your life before the Lord as you follow Christ. There is, he just mentions that of a soldier. I fought the good fight, finished the race. Those metaphors, again, used by the Spirit to describe the Christian life, that is a race. That is a race, better yet, a marathon. That's really what it pictures here. Now, again, chapter 11, we see these great individuals, wonderful saints. We, we, we have them as, and it says in verse 12, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And a, a couple things here. I don't want you to think that these cloud of witnesses are looking down on us watching us run the race i really don't think that's heaven i wouldn't want to think of my grandfather looking down on me seeing everything that's happening in my life that's not what that is this is it is this it is this these cloud of witnesses show us what it is to trust the word of god to look forward to what's before us and to live out of that conviction and there's a connection here. God enabled them. He can enable us. Let's look at verse 1 again in chapter 12. Uh, and I want you to notice something. It talks about an encumbrance here. And I just want to mention, we want to set aside or get rid of that encumber encumbrance. It says, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run. Let us run. Get rid of the encumbrance. Uh, what particular sin this is, I'm not sure. I believe it's, it focuses on some type of sin. I believe what the Lord is getting at here is, to do, is that make choices 
uh, of the best things that won't slow you down, that won't weigh you down as you press on toward Christ. And I, I believe it's for each of us, it's that we should do some introspection here, some self-examination by the word of God and understand that, okay, where am I right with God? Where have I grabbed onto some, threw something on my back that I'm carrying that's some kind of sin that is weighing me down? And he mentions here that so easily entangles us. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Oh, hard to run a Christian life when you're weighted down with sin that's entangling your ability to run. And this sin, it says it easily besets us. In this context, uh, it seems to me it's, I believe it's a sin of unbelief. Uh, I'm not saying you need to join Weight Watchers. I'm not saying that. He's not talking about actual body weight. He's talking about something that's sinful that can weigh us down. I think the primary thing here is uh, the sin of unbelief. Chapter 12 is a faith chapter. And we have individuals, one after another, that trusted in the word of God. They looked to the Lord. They walked by faith. Now, we can get weighed down with that sin of unbelief or many other sins. There's a million of them out there that believers are capable of. Uh, and they keep us from wanting, running well. It could be the guilt of, of some sinful thing that I've not dealt with God, uh, that I've not dealt with before God. Sin can do that. It can weigh us down. It can keep us from running well. And the guilt of unconfessed sin can bring the Christian life to a crawl. They were tempted to think that, uh, they were tempted to think of Jesus less than he was. And not, it, these early believers, not look to him as they should. Remember, the author, to this point, has built the case that Jesus is supreme to everything. All the Old Testament sacrifices, the priests, everything, the angels, he's supreme in everything. Get rid of the weight. Whatever weight is entangling you. You don't see marathon runners. You don't see those running the 3,200 meter uh, in, in backpacks. You don't see them in full clothing. They're running as light as they can, and that's what we need to do. So get rid of that weight, that sin that so easily entangles us. And get a mindset to endure. Look at the end of verse 12. Run with endurance. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. I've watched the state finals uh, for some years and tracks. It's been a bit since I've done that. But to me, it's a, it's a delight to see these athletes that have, have performed and continue to perform at a high level. And to participate in the state finals, in the track meet, you need to qualify as being at the top of, of an athlete in whatever event or, or, or division you participate in. And when you get there, when you get there, you check in. You're given a number that's placed on your uniform so officials can tell who you are and where you're going to finish, where you finish in that event. You know, when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ, you begin immediately to participate in that marathon, that race of faith, when you trust him as Savior. You're known to, to God. He knows your name. He knows you intimately. You're in now in a race, whether you uh, knew that or not, but you are. He's qualified you through faith in Christ Jesus. You've trusted him. You're in the race. Now you are running. Every one of you here today in Christ are running this race and the mindset you must have is to finish to endure to bear up under a heavy load that's what endurance means the power you have to run is the grace that's poured into you daily and continues daily as daily grace and daily bread you have the word of God before you his spirit indwelling you you have no choice as to whether or not you're going to compete because the race has begun. The race has begun. Your mindset, my mindset, has to be one of finishing this race and finishing it well. It's been my prayer for years for all of us here to finish the race well. There's a real concern that I have for all of us. Too many times believers will say it's too hard. It's too difficult. It's too costly. I can't do it. And 
They may think, well, the dividends don't add up. I got all this stuff right now. That's what I'm laboring for instead of looking to the eternal. Uh, th those are all lies from the enemy. The worst thing a person can do is buy the lie that I cannot do it, or worse yet, this is really where it gets to, is God cannot do it through me. Finish the race well. Run well. Continue to endure. Set aside that encumbrance, that sin that so easily entangles you and run. God will see you through. God will see you through. Secondly, from verse 2, I, I want you, when you think about this race, I, I want you to think about who to focus on. Look at verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Focus on him. Look to Jesus. We've been looking at others in chapter 11. They finished well. That chapter describes individuals, incredible individuals who are, I would say, were very ordinary men and women who looked to God. And what about Jesus? Well, he's the author. Our faith began with him. And it'll be completed. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He will see us through. Because of who he is and what he did on our, on our behalf, he's the one we must fix our eyes on. Now, I love, this, I love to do a study in the Old Testament. We were recently looking at David. We didn't get very far with that. Moses, Joseph, um, all those others. I love those Old Testament saints, Abraham, Ruth. You can learn so much, but listen. We don't look to Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, or Moses, those ones in the 11th chapter. We don't look to them. They're great examples to us. They encourage us. They help us to know that God can work through someone who's yielded to him. But we look to someone else, as admirable as old, those Old Testament saints were. And by the way, I can't wait to one day get next to one of them. We look to someone greater, someone immeasurably greater. We look to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus. We look to him. Why look to him? Why should our focus in this race of life be him? Well, man, I could preach a long time now to answer that question. And I will have you out by the Super Bowl. But we look to him because of who he is. He's the magnificent Savior who knows no equal, fully incomparable to anything or anyone. Look at Hebrews 1. Verses 2 through 4 with me. These are fantastic. Sunday school this morning, we looked to Jesus as well. From the book of Colossians, some things that were said there. Therefore, what is this? Where am I going? How did I end up here? It's supposed to be. That's not it. I have to tell you, I inserted those verses. You're going to turn there. I inserted those verses at 6.30 this morning, and they're not there. Go back to Hebrews 1. We still have Bibles, right? We can turn there. So Hebrews 1 is just describing the supremacy and greatness of Jesus. You get to verse 2, it says about him, in these days, about the Father, in these days has spoken to us, in his son or by his son who he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world well why should we look to jesus what is there about him well he is the son the eternal son the son of god god in the flesh hebrews 1 2 and not only that he's been appointed heir of all things he's the heir and he's creator uh, through whom also he made the world. That includes you and I. Verse 3, he is the radiance of his glory. That's the glory of the Father. He's the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purifications of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's the son. He's the heir. He's the creator. He's the glory of the Father. 
in person. He's the imprint, the exact representation of God the Father. He's the sustainer of all things. He's the purifier. He sat down after he made purification of sins. He sat down. He, uh, he is exalted in that position at the right hand of the Father today. That's why we look to Jesus. And finally, look at verse 4. He's just better, having become so much better than the angels, as he inherited a more excellent name than they. You can turn back to the 12th chapter again. Furthermore, and that's just amazing. And you, you could preach for Sundays on, on, on the greatness of, of our Lord. He's the one we look at. But just a couple other things here. He isn't aloof. He isn't unconcerned or uncaring or out of touch with us. He understands us intimately. I'm going to get to the right one here, I think. Sometime there should be a... Yeah. Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are yet without sin. That is so precious to me. He knows and understands me perfectly. You know, there's not a tear that you and I have. There's not a heartache that you and I ha have. There's not a joy that has come into our life that Jesus doesn't see and know and understand. There's not a temptation that he cannot identify with. Look at Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brothers, like us, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest and pertain to the things of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Well, how did he do that? How does he understand it? Since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Isn't that sweet? I love that about our Lord. And then Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he's able, Jesus is able to save forever or to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's why we look to him. He prays for you. He makes intercession. He's our advocate. He's God in the flesh, the creator of mankind. And he knows and understands you and I perfectly. We focus, we look to him. He's able, he's able, he's able. He always lives forever. He's risen. A risen Savior can, can be the one who carries us along, and he ought to be the one we are focused on. Look to Jesus. Set your eyes on him. Set your eyes on him. Continually look to him. When you don't, when you look to yourself, I'll tell you what, that is not a good day. You guys ever have that problem, right? Phew. Yeah, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, one day the cross was going to come, he would be done, he would be exalted at the right hand of the Father, it would be finished. Fix your eyes on him. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, finally, I want you to see how, I want you to see how he ran. How did he run? Well, what an example he is in this race of faith, this walk that we have, this life. He ran with joy. His race on earth was one that was done by faith as he looked to the Father and lived out everything that the Father told him to do. He always sought to please him. There was joy before him. There was joy before him in that one day it would be finished. He saw the big picture, the 30,000 foot picture. You know, we, we're right here, right? Here's my life. Oh, if we could get beyond that a little bit, take the big picture of life and understand in that way, it would look different. But you and I are in a marathon. You and I only see what is right here before us. We need that eternal view. We need to see it from God's perspective. Those dark days will one day give way to his glorious light. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. Do you guys believe that? We have to believe that. You know, we're, we're just a, our lives are just a, well, they're just a vapor. They're just a vapor. We were on the uh, Menani River yesterday, and believe it or not, there was, uh, there was a white pine across the river 
We were Pierce Gorge. And from that white pine, there was this uh, uh, pollen just float up from that tree. It'd go a little ways and it's gone. Then the wind would move a little bit again. That pollen would f just flow away from that tree in a little bit. It's all gone. That's really, that's about our lives. It just flies along and it's gone. And you guys can't believe how old some of your classmates are. <laughs> and they can't believe how old you are. And, and we're just surprised by that. But Jesus ran with joy because he was doing the Father's will. And one day, this momentary light affliction is going to all be gone. Jesus, in his last week of his life, he knew what was coming. And what did he do? He ministered. He cared for others. In that moment of, of time, he said, Father, forgive them. In that moment, he kept his mind on what was yet to come. We need to do the same. We must do the same. For believers, those hard moments will one day surrender to the glorious future that we will behold. Keep looking to him. Keep looking to him. And run with endurance here. We see that. He endured the cross. That's the second time we've seen that here in these verses. Verse 1 talked about it. Verse 2. Consider here means to estimate, to contemplate, to, to weigh or assess our Lord. And if you make the right assessment, I believe it will lead you to run with endurance. You know, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and said enough of this. He didn't. While he was being beaten, he could have spoke a word and took the life out of the person that did that, but he wouldn't. He endured. He bore up under a heavy load. He persevered while others forsook him, mocked him, and betrayed him. He forgave. So keep your eyes fixed on him. When I think of Jesus and his journey, I think of a man of incredible courage. See, verse 3, consider him who endured such hostility by sinners. We see this, again, this word, endure, bear up under a heavy load, persevere. Think of his journey, his determination. When I do, I see one who's willing to humble himself to the race that the Father set before him. And he was determined to finish and to finish well. We all have a race. And it most likely will be wrought with difficulty, doubts, despair, heart-wrenching situations. It is very likely as well to have included in it times of incredible joy and triumph. But we must run that race. And these things will come. I know this, my race has been difficult, laced with grief, but also with incredible joy. I praise God for it. And I'm not alone in my challenges because you have challenges in your race. But you and I are not alone. You know, we're not, I, don't, I hope you don't think this way, but we're not the first children of the living God to run a race, a marathon that was very difficult. A Jeremiah, the prophet of old, pretty special place in my heart. His calling was amazing. Look at it here. Jeremiah 7, 27, so you shall speak all these words to them, to the people. They will listen. There will be great revival in Jeremiah. You're going to prosper. No. I'm glad this wasn't my calling. They will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. Jeremiah, your race is going to be tough. You get to chapter 25, and Jeremiah could say, my race has been tough. 25.3, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, these 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me. I've spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. That's Jeremiah's race. That's his marathon. Not easy, right? Not easy. It's not an easy road. 
Jesus could say just before the cross to the Father, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished, excuse me, accomplished the, work, the work which you have given to me. Jesus' race, his, his marathon was not easy. We see this word finished a little later in John 19, where he says from the cross, it is finished. That was a hard race. That was a difficult run. The apostles, Jesus said to them, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have tribulation. But take courage, take courage, take the big picture. I've overcome, and you and me have overcome as well. In me, you're more than a conqueror. I have overcome. When I think of a race, I think of Paul's. I think it's because of all the reading I've done, the sermons I've done, he's kind of become dear to me. But here's what was predicted of him by the Lord when he came to faith. The Lord said to him, this is Ananias, he's speaking of Paul, he's speaking to Ananias, a guy that's going to go and interact with Paul who was scared to death to do it because he knew this Saul at that time was a persecutor of the church. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. Sounds, that sounds great, right? But notice the rest. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Five times, Paul said, I received 40 lashes from the Jews. He knew, and he lived it, and he ran his race with endurance in Here's what he said in his last letter just before his death. I've already, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. That is such a beautiful picture. It's an amazing picture of a bondservant. A drink offering. It was poured out on the altar. And everything is given. It's just, Paul says, that's what it is. I've released myself. I'm just being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. He kept looking to Jesus. God is all over our lives. Nothing comes to us that hasn't been approved by him. Our race is set before us. It's a marathon, and marathons are grueling. But when you get to the finish line, not that I've run a marathon, but those marathoners that get to the finish line, pure joy. They're glad. They're thankful. They did it. They kept their eyes on something. They wanted to finish. Brothers and sisters, we will one day see Jesus, not through eyes of faith, but face to face, keep running. Look to Jesus. If we get our gaze off from him, if we focus, if our focus becomes things, circumstances, and people, we can lose heart. Notice how verse 3 finishes. Consider him or look to Jesus who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Why in the world would God put that in the scripture? Because we can grow weary and we can lose heart. If our gaze isn't on Jesus, if it's on others, circumstances and so forth, we can lose heart. Have you ever lost heart? I'll tell you, it's an awful place to be. Do you know that we are susceptible to this, each of us? That's why we are told to look to him, to consider him. The trials of life and the grind of living in the sin-stained world can weigh us down. We can lose heart and become worry, weary. Excuse me. Worse yet, some will give up. They'll abandon the race. They'll step off the track and say, enough. Not finishing can never be an option for us. Throwing in the towel or tapping out is not an option. As I read this text, I was reminded of a, a pastor friend of mine that has been so faithful. It was in a conference, he was speaking, and he said, so many times I felt like throwing in the towel. He said, when I do, it gets thrown right back at me. <laughs> yeah, we can't. We can't give up. 
We must not become weary. We can't tap out, throw in the towel, or say enough is enough. We can't do that. This great cloud of witnesses, chapter 11, by the way, you might take some time this week and be encouraged by them. They finished the races. They endured. I believe that God is setting this before us right here, right now. And letting us see their faith, those who enabled and endured and got through, that we might be encouraged. They kept looking to him. They kept looking to him. Let's be among those who endured, who finished their race well. Amen? We must be those people. It wasn't real hard to con get a, con a concluding thought here from this text. That's as easy as it gets, right? You can hang on to that. Continually look to Jesus. When things get sideways, get your mind back there. When you don't know what to do, he invites you to the throne of grace. Pray, lay it on him, and move forward. Continually look to him. Loving Father, help us. We are so prone to wander. We are so easily dissuaded from where we need to be and, and convinced to, to go another direction. And Father, I, I would ask that you would help us as your children to continually look to our beautiful Savior who knows us, who loves us, who gave himself up for us, who continually offers grace and comfort and who knows every temptation every disappointment, every fear. Help us to look to him. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'd like to give the congregation an update regarding our church. As you may recall, on October 15th last year, Pastor Brad announced to the congregation that the elders were working through a situation that had been brought to our attention. It was our sole intent and focus to adhere to biblical principles and mandates throughout the handling of this situation. We'd like to inform the church that this issue has been thoroughly investigated the elder board is in unity and considers the issue completely resolved. Also, we would like to give the congregation an update regarding our pastoral situation. As you know, both of our pastors have resigned their respective positions. In August last year, Pastor Brad told the elders that Pastor West no longer felt called to serve as a youth pastor. In the same meeting, Pastor West informed the elders that he had no longer felt called to serve as a worship team leader. We began to have conversations seeking how we could plug Pastor West into an area of the church where he felt he would be within God's calling. As stated in his resignation letter, Pastor West's eventually depart departure was due to him being the Lord leading him in a new direction of ministry, especially in teaching, and that he has taken an instru inst instructional teaching position at Frontier School of the Bible. At the annual congregational meeting in January of 2024, church members voted to support Wes and Katie and their family through our missions fund. Recently, Pastor Brad met with the elders, and during that meeting, he informed the elder board that he felt that his time at Barker Revival Church is ending, and he and Becky are seeking the Lord for their new next assignment. The elder board, along with the full church board, as said in the motion, a search committee for our next pastor. We have began to process the process of contacting pastors. We also uh, contacted Bible Related Ministry, a church supported organization that Barker Revival Church supports as a missionary to assist in establishing an interim pastor position. We are also leaning on their expertise and experience to gain guidance in this process. As a unified elder board and a church board, we believe God has a plan for Barker Revival Church. We believe he has prepared the exact right man to lead us who will boldly proclaim the word and, and shepherd this wonderful flock. We also feel we are filled with peace knowing that God is in control and holds us in his hands. We are committed to 
to remain a church that believes all scripture is true and inspired word of God and that is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that we may be adequate to equip uh, for every good work to the glory of God. Your servants in Christ, the bark of our Bible, full, full board. We are asking you guys to please pray for the church board, for the pastoral search committee, but also for Pastor Brad, Pastor West, and his families. You know, the Barker Revival Church has been blessed because of Pastor Brad's ministry for here for over 22 years. And we will truly miss him and pray God will bless them in their future ministry. Thank you, and you're dismissed.